Worth Abbey in Sussex is home to a community of 22 Benedictine monks. Last year, they agreed to take part in a unique experiment. The BBC asked them to open the doors of their cloistered world to five outsiders. The aim is to discover whether the 1,500-year-old monastic tradition has anything to offer modern life. The five men were selected by the BBC from hundreds of volunteers. The monks have no idea who their guests will be, but are looking forward to the challenge. We find that people say to us that they've got more and more of all these superficial pleasures in life, and yet at a deeper level, they're not happy. We believe that what we're offering is, in fact, the answer to that dissatisfaction with life. The five volunteers will live under the monks' rules of silence, obedience and humility for 40 days and 40 nights. For each, it will be a challenging journey of self-discovery. Volunteering to spend six weeks in a monastery is not to be taken lightly. Good to meet you. Hi, good to meet you, Tony. Each of those selected has his own particular reason for wanting to be here. I'm Luke. All have agreed to leave behind friends, family, careers, while they go in search of life's deeper meaning. It is light. It's very light. I won't guess what's in here. <laughs> it's a parachute. <laughs> And I introduce Abbot Christopher, who is in uh, right, the superior of the community. For the duration of their stay, the new arrivals will be required to abandon the temptations and distractions of the outside world. Nicholas. Perhaps for the first time, they'll have the space to really question their values and priorities and discover if what they learn here can sustain them in their lives outside. Penny, we've got a room right? The bedrooms, like those of the monks, contain only a bed, a desk, a wardrobe, and definitely no TV. Monastic life may prove especially challenging for Anthony Wright, who works for a legal publishing company in London. The thing is, I can't hear you while I've got these on. Is that a problem? Quiet contemplation is not really his style. And, you know, I've been to Miami, New York, L.A., Barcelona, Ibiza, and, you know, and I, I go to nice places, I hang out with nice people. Although, like many people, Anthony does believe there's something out there, religion plays very little part in his hectic day-to-day -day life. I think it would be quite nice just to get a bit of that tranquil side. You can't ask me what am I expecting to find. I don't know what I'm going to find until I get there. I might get there and not like it, you know. might get there and love it. I might want to be a monk. You never know. During their stay, the group will undertake a crash course in monastic living, devised by the abbot and his community. Daily sessions will introduce them to the principles of Benedictine life. They will also be expected to join in the daily routine, eating with the monks, working with them, and praying with them six times a day. If you just follow that route, there'll always be something you pick up here. Which but their biggest test may be learning, as all monks must do, how to live harmoniously with complete strangers. Something Peter Griffith hasn't had to do since national service. A retired teacher and published poet from Bristol, Peter rejected organized religion in his youth. I do believe that there is a God, but I wouldn't characterize or describe him, she or it in any of the conventional terms. <laughs> Quite literally, as Monty Python put it, what's the meaning of life, you know? I sometimes get groups of young children just to sit in here and I say, can you hear it? It's called silence. For some, just being in a church is an alien experience. 
Tony Burke is 29 and from Essex. I don't come from a religious background, so I think it's fair to say that I don't believe in God. Most of his working life has been spent in the world of advertising, until recently. He's now producing trailers for a sex chat line. I don't really consider myself working in sex industries, really. I mean, it's just something I'm doing at the moment, and everyone wins. I don't have any kind of moral hang-up on it at all. Just uh, keep your mouth nice and moist. If I can learn anything from this, it would be what is good and what is bad. You know, if this can give me a really firm grounding and a launch pad for the next 29 years of my life, then, then that's a great thing. There are six times a day when we come together as a community to pray. They vary from 10 minutes to 30, 35 minutes. Part of it is to get into the rhythm of the prayer, and uh, we'll see how you get on with that. Obviously, Perhaps the most surprising um, candidate to volunteer for a stint in a Roman Catholic monastery is Gary McCormick. I was born in Northern Ireland, and I always liked the Protestant side of things, and when I was 18, I joined the UDA. I joined it more to be accepted than to actually uh, be involved in the troubles. His time with the paramilitaries led Gary to spend much of his early life in prison. Twelve years on, he still carries the emotional scars. And really uh, homing in on these, these things of distrust, these things of fear, these things of rejection, I can really uh, deal with it once and for all. After their tour of the Abbey Church, the new arrivals meet the community over Sunday dinner. It's the only meal of the week during which the monks are permitted to drink alcohol or speak. So obviously none of you are married in a physical sense. No, you wouldn't be. You wouldn't be able to if you were, you wouldn't be able to join a monastery if you're married. You've got to be seen. When you first come to a monastery, you haven't met the people before, just like you today. So you have to try and live together. You must get monk rage. Sure. Monk rage. Actually, you do occasionally get monk rage, but they're quite good at handling it. You experience monk rage from a few. Yes, threw me over the hedge. You threw you over the hedge? Yeah. Right. I'll try not to throw you over the hedge. <laughs> Nicholas Buxton is the only member of the group with any experience of monastic life, but that was spent with Buddhist monks in India. Now a PhD student at Cambridge, Nick has been on a spiritual search for the last 10 years. Initially drawn to Buddhism, he has since returned to his Anglican roots. I go to church quite frequently. But a part of me doesn't believe in what I'm doing. Everything is, uh, you know, an intellectual argument rather than just a matter of faith and practice. And there is the sense that it's taken the sort of heart out of it, and I would like to put the heart back into it. Like all Benedictine monasteries, life at Worth is based on the rule of St. Benedict. It was written early in the 6th century as a practical and spiritual guide to monastic living. So here are all the members of the Worth community that have ever been. Uh, what does uh, the D-O-M mean all the time? The yeah. Dom. Okay, good. Dom is the traditional way of calling a Benedictine monk. Oh, is and it? it's the short version of Domnus, which is the Latin word for mister. All right. Ah. As in Dom Perignon. As in Dom Perignon, well said. Yeah, there's a man who, <laughs> what you don't know. Champagne lifestyle. What you, it's the champagne lifestyle. Of course, that's where monks meet champagne lifestyle, is in Dom Perignon, because Ignorant, Dom yeah. Perignon was oh, a Benedictine monk. <laughs> The first word of Benedict's rule is listen, and silence is a key part of monastic life. At 9.30 every night, the community goes into the summum silencium, or greater silence, which lasts until after breakfast the following morning, and which the new arrivals will be expected to observe. This morning was like, you know, 
this really is quite strange, isn't it? And really, what am I doing here? You know, it's nearly ten past six, and I've now got to go into the chapel and pray and stuff like that. It's work, isn't it? I suppose it's like, you know, this is what you're here to do, and it's like, it's not funny anymore. <laughs> Lords, the second service of the day is only half an hour away. Time that is spent in silent contemplation. The silence is like a wonderful spiritual bath, which we invite you to get into to relax your spiritual muscles so that you can start listening to God, listening to other people, and listening with the ear of your heart to your own deepest self. Even the walk from church to breakfast in the refectory should be conducted in silence. I must apologise, I missed the second service. Let me leave you in. Thank you. It's only when breakfast is over, two and a half hours after getting up, that speech is once again permitted. Basically what the couple does, they sell live sex chats off the screen mm -hmm. and text big boobs to 8499 and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. A bit of girl right. girl yeah. titillation, there's no blokes involved, <laughs> it's just uh, lipstick lesbian stuff. Oh, well, not a bad job, is it? <laughs> no, <it's laughs> I've had worse. <laughs> You do need a break from it. <laughs> Will you come to the right place? You'll not see anything like that, will you? <laughs> According to Father Christopher's plan for the group, the first week will be spent learning the routine. Each morning, he or Father Luke, the novice master, will introduce the group to key monastic values. I think what I received most appreciated most from this morning was that silent period. We're talking about silence. Because I don't come from any faith. Or I, at, at this period in my life, I don't have God in my life. There's actually nothing to fill that silence. At the moment, it is kind of blank silence. So I think my short-term objective would be to try and work out how to use that silence and benefit from it. I'd probably say it's at the other angle for me, because actually when <clears throat> there is silence, I'm actually thinking. You know, and I constantly think about family members, past, you know, ones that are dead, ones that are here, and you, you just use that time to even say a prayer for them, because I'm not religious, or so to say, but I am very aware of a higher being. I know a lot about silence, if you know what I mean. I spent long periods of time in solitary confinement through misdemeanors in prison. So for me to come here, it isn't, it isn't a struggle. After midday prayer and lunch in silence, just half an hour is set aside for recreation. It's an ideal opportunity to get to know the monks. I think it's always got to be an individualism, it makes a choice, mm. which is the way to the good for me. Mm. And I've stayed with it and um, here I am in these funny clothes and um, 
Brighton nil, Plymouth two, and Brighton had a man sent off. What sort of team? That was like a no goal, Very, a know. man sent off, and then a penalty. Yeah. God, I'm not too worried about that. Guy, really. Dead and off game. Puddle like us here. I've read a wee prayer out for you. That's really good of you. Really and good of you, Gary. and yeah. I've, I've said to the Lord, Lord, please, would you help uh, brother Rob? Because I know he'll be in morning this morning after after the game last night. I appreciate that, Gary, but I think we'll be okay. It's a fairly busy time today. Yeah, it is, isn't it? It's very, you need to you learn a lot of discipline through it, I think. Take a few days to get into it, but once you get into it, it'll be all right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm sure there'll be a few missed appointments. <laughs> I think so. A few missed appointments, uh, we've got. I could, I could feel like going to bed now. I'm knackered. By the time the men head back to church for a public mass at 5.30, they're beginning to get a sense of the challenge that lies ahead of them. Mass is followed by another half hour silence before Vespers and finally dinner. The last service of the day is Compline at nine o'clock. With an hour to spare after the evening meal, Father Mark volunteers to answer any questions the new arrivals may have about monastic life. I think the celibacy thing would be very hard to come to terms with, wouldn't it? Mm. It's not a selling point. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't think so. Unless you're a eunuch or something. So are you totally content, like, that you, don't, you will never have a family or children? I don't think you could ever say... Well, I would never say that that is a state of contentment. Obviously, it's a denial, but it's not about saying there's something wrong with marriage, something wrong with family, something wrong with physical sexuality. It's about saying there is something greater in the future, and for the sake of something greater in the future, it's worth making a sacrifice of something now. So how many of the monks would you say were... Or is that a personal question? <laughs> how many it depends monks... what was in the blank that you didn't... <laughs> 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 Nicely picked up on. <laughs> uh, I was hoping you were going to fill in the blank. I think it's fair to say that's a question we don't usually ask one another. <laughs> Fifteen hours and five services later, and the group is approaching the end of its first full day in the monastery. <laughs> One day, and I'm already thinking, oh, I really got to be here for six weeks. It's incredible. It's as if you really don't have any time for yourself. And to think that some of these people have done this for 25 to 30 years, it's very difficult. It's a very comfortable environment for a bunch of men to live in. If you're 16 and you're looking for a career with guaranteed success, you know, get yourself down to your local monastery because um, I don't think it's the hardest job in the world. And you can be easily very good at it just by towing the line and not swearing and, uh, and not having sex with anyone. There's 22 monks in here, and every one of them love you and accept you. The acceptance here is like, to me, it's like walking into heaven. Having already attended two services before breakfast, Nick makes the most of the silent time. Father Christopher had hoped that all members of the group would value the silence and willingly put aside any potential distractions. Okay. Yeah, well, you could do that. You could just... But for those unused to it, yeah. too much silence can be unsettling. Well, I'll, I'll text it to you, yeah? All right, then, darling. Supposed to listen to that in your room. All oh, right, yeah. Part sorry. of the rule. Yeah, that's right. Well, no. What's that say? I'm trying to put it on for a minute. 
Yeah, where's the go button? I've done one. That's two minutes. minutes. No, no, one minute. Starts. Starts that one. Okay. Go. <laughs> But you're a good abbot. Terrible <laughs> coffee maker. Te yes. A good abbot. <laughs> what have you got? You're trying to pass me five quid? It's money, Father. <laughs> we use it on the outside. <laughs> we exchange it for goods. <laughs> Today's session of religious instruction is all about learning how to interpret the Bible and engage with what lies behind the words. The monastic tradition doesn't want to see the Bible as a book of answers. It sees it more as a book of poetry, which it feels that if you will enter into that poetic movement, your soul will start to be shaped by it. And as it becomes filled with the poetry of Scripture, your soul will expand and your heart will become more generous. In the end, remember, it's the word of God which comes to me through the text. Does that not make your life easier when there's things in the Bible that you don't necessarily agree with, you can say, ah, but that's all down to interpretation. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's your little kind of disclaimer at the end, saying, no, we don't agree with this. But, you know, um, Absolutely. it's down to interpretation. Yeah, it's very easy to, um, to take the, what are called the hard sayings of the Bible and put them into a box marked, well, it's all down to interpretation. Yeah, and, and we can have a good kind of theology, religious studies kind of discussion at that level, OK? Yeah. Now, what you then feel is that I cheat a bit, or that, that regularly people like me would cheat a little bit on that by saying, I but there's another level. I think, you've, I think there's a tendency to kind of fill in a few gaps. It's kind of quite do-it-yourself, really. It's like, you know, if you've got any problems, lads, if there's anything you don't understand, just know that God is in your, your heart or in your soul and everything will make sense. I can give you a very, very searing set of reasons why we should dismiss the Bible out of hand. Yeah. I can give you that analytic argument at this level, right? But at my own personal level, this text feeds me in a way which never ceases to amaze me. At the end of the day, I'm never going to win an argument because they will win every time because it's down to interpretation of the theological test. You know, I'm not a bigot. I want to be convinced. If they can't convince me, I'll just go away from this thing unconvinced. You know, that's my challenge to them, and in return, their challenge to me, I guess. But, uh, no, I feel kind of empowered by that, and I really enjoyed that, that, that session. It was good. Every afternoon, the monks change into civvies for manual work around the estate. Tony and Gary are supervised by Father Bede. I think Tony's at the moment at a very normal contemporary place. Namely, he's got a lot of ideas, a lot of questions about whether there's more to life than what he's currently doing, about whether religion's got something to say to him, and he's got 101 objections and questions regarding spiritual and religious life. And that it, at a certain point he has to make a choice as to whether the insights of the human heart are going to come first and the questions later, or whether the questions are going to come first so that in a way he never gets to the insights of the human heart. So this is going to be interesting to see how monastic life might or might not help Tony to get to the heart of the business. While Tony and Gary cut back trees, Anthony and Peter are gardening with Father Patrick. Yeah, there's just something, something about sort of working with your hands and your feet and, and every other bit of you. That's, um, yeah, it's more wholeness. It's good, good for the whole, whole person. Yep. <laughs> and we do it every day of the week, every day of the year. Just like the monastic life. Do the same thing over and over again. <laughs> It's like a drug, isn't it? When you're in the city and you're familiar with a routine, when that stops, it's like coming off it. It's a come down, isn't it? I think that was happening yesterday, basically, when I was like, God, what's going on here? This is like, is this real? But today I kind of realised and thought, well, mm, OK, I can feel the rhythm of it here, basically. I'm quite fascinated to know what's behind it or what makes them tick, what made them in the first place come into it, because, I mean, coming into somewhere like this at 21... 
It's got to be a big step in your life. I mean, what else was you doing that would make you be so bored that you want to come here, basically? Well... Father Peter gave up a career in the Royal Marines to join the monastery ten years ago. During his second session on meditation, he explains why. I suppose about two or three years before I joined the monastery, I was going through a difficult time, drinking too much, generally getting lost and not really knowing why and becoming a bit confused by it all. And after a particular weekend, I remember thinking, you know, I've just got to get a grip of where I am. And that evening I was lying in bed um, and then um, an extraordinary thing happened because I became aware of a figure in the room and this figure I was looking at was actually me. And um, in that uh, recognition... Um, there was a great compassion, there was a great love, a great um, acceptance. And then very slowly, this figure just moved into me. And from feeling right down low, I was suddenly just picked up and felt on top of the world. And it suddenly dawned on me the importance of the spiritual side. And to allow the presence of God to work through you. Hearing that even monks can struggle to like themselves and that God can provide the answers inspires Gary to begin sharing some of his past. I couldn't keep out of prison. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't keep out of it. Yeah. I have hit rock bottom many times and there's many times I've lay in a prison cell and I've cried my eyes out. And I remember lying in my bed, and, and this is a gospel truth, I remember saying to God, Lord, if you can get me out of this prison, I'll give my life back to you. I touched drugs a little bit, dabbled, but I ended up smoking pot every night. But it was making me really angry, and I remember a, my mother come up to visit me, and, and this was the turning point in my life. I remember she, I asked her to bring me certain stuff up, and she didn't bring me. And I remember saying to her in, in the visit, just... Will you? And I remember, and I, it was the drugs that was making me do it. And I remember her walking out, crying her eyes out, you know, from the visit. And she, she was the only one who ever really stood by me, you know, all my life. And It was during one of his many stays in prison that Gary says he found God. But no matter how hard he tries to live a Christian life, the past always seems to intrude. There's so many things going on in my emotions and my mind, and I feel very insecure about myself or inferior about myself. Then I think everybody else can see it. Obviously they can't, but it's very hard to tell yourself otherwise. Later that afternoon, Gary seeks guidance from the abbot. You've obviously been through much bigger traumas than most people think God will have to go through. Yeah. But I think what the monastery can give you is a place of acceptance. You know, instead of putting myself down, I might as well start to be positive instead of being negative about the aspects of, of the past of my life. Because I believe, and I do believe, that I'm going to find freedom from it. I really do. Yeah. It's interesting what you said about not putting yourself down so yeah. much because I've noticed that, that, yeah. that you did, I've done you did all my do life. that a lot. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things I would want to um, get you to just reflect on is that you don't need to keep doing that yeah. because um, one of the things that living in a, in a community teaches you is that everybody has got some particular aspect of themselves that pulls them yeah. down. This morning, one of us confessed to a pain and a guilt which brought tears. And I did realize that all of us are here, perhaps, to search out for those 
sore points in our lives, those areas of great hurt which we have buried, which I have buried, and which we do not care to revisit too often. Obviously something happened with Gary today, I'm not quite sure what it was. He told me a little bit, so obviously there's a few issues going on there. We all have issues at the end of the day. Um, some just a bit more clearer than others, and some of us can deal with them and some of us can't. I just want to be content and at peace with who I am. And you know, it's starting to happen. And I never, ever, ever thought in my life it would happen in a place like this here. Although not everyone is ready to be as open and honest as Gary, Tony has realized that if he too is to get the most out of his time in the monastery, he will need to face up to his past. We were part of a maybe done it from the advertising agency we were working for, so we got paid off and nothing came up for a while and you know I became increasingly despondent and I started drinking too much and then that became a routine. And I found myself in a fairly dark place entertaining some pretty dark thoughts, I suppose. I didn't want to carry on. I didn't want to physically um, occupy another single second or minute on the earth. I wanted somehow for the problem to be taken away. So uh, I turned to my parents, you know, and they, they whisked me off to hospital and, and within 24 hours I was, you know, in a, in a safe place. It was just a rehab centre for drugs and booze. I'm more willing to talk about it because things are changing for me in this place. But, you know, I'm a grown man and I should be able to face up to my responsibilities. And, uh, you know, if I can't handle my drink, then that's just something I need to adjust in my life. For Nick, obedience to the rule is not a hardship. Well, this is a spot I, I've chosen in the monastery, and I usually come here uh, before the first office um, between at about 6. I'll come here at about, about 6 o'clock and just walk up and down gently for about 15 minutes and then go into the church. I find the mornings um, are quite a good time for me to to sort of chew things over, as the monks are telling us, we need to chew things over. For the rest of the group, the concept of obedience is proving more challenging. We're going to look for virgins and cigarettes in the nearest town. Listen, I am not looking for virgins. <laughs> he might be. I'm looking for cigarettes and chocolate and look at it. I'm definitely looking for virgins and cigarettes. But if, we, if all we can get is Luke's open, that's fine. Yep. Yep. Fit. Yep. Fit. <laughs> In the grand scheme of things, jogging down to the shops for treats, listening to Stevie Wonder's greatest hits on your personal stereo, or grabbing 40 winks instead of reading your Bible are minor misdemeanors. But to Father Christopher, these breaches of the rules represent a basic misunderstanding of what obedience, a core monastic value, is really about. I'm just suffering from total exhaustion. Ah. And I just seem to be dragging my rather limp bulk from one church to the next, to the next. I think the, the essence of it is it's tiring being obedient to somebody else's timetable. I haven't been that obedient. <laughs> ah, well, we'll talk about it. <laughs> cool. Right, so are the chaps ready? Yeah, we're all done. Yeah. Are, they, are they next door? Mm -hmm. Good. Well, there's um, Anthony and me. Good. Father Christopher feels it's time to introduce the group to some of Benedict's more challenging ideas. If you look at the way St Benedict writes his rule, it's very obvious that Obedience, silence and humility are at the heart of what he thinks are the tools that monks use in order to respond to God's love. So let's just take the interesting practical example that um, 
Tony brought up this morning. Do you want to share that with us? What about running down to the shop? Yes. <laughs> it didn't take a genius to work out that, um, you know, I, I, was, I was doing wrong. I was, I was disobeying. So I was right. indulging temptation. Um, yes, and another point Anthony just made? Not asking permission. So you feel indulging yourself, not asking permission. Mm -hmm. And I think the point to hang on to, though, is that it's not a discussion about whether or not chocolate is a good thing or a bad thing. It's not about that. No. Um, it's to do with how you respond to your own impulses and how you allow yourself to be shaped by other people's lives, which is the permission thing. And this is the kind of depth at which Benedict's proposing it to us. And what he wants you to achieve is that inner freedom which says, well, my impulse is to go that way, but I'm being asked to go the other way, so I'll go the other way, because I want to be free from that impulse. And I think there is a bit uh, around in contemporary society that thinks that I'm being able to indulge my impulses when I want is the peak of freedom. And what the rule is saying is, actually, no, there is a better freedom. And I think that's the challenge for you is, is this way of life going to help you to be true to yourself in a new way and find a new freedom? Or is it just going to stay at the level of, um, I'll follow the routine and occasionally make little trips out <laughs> to sort of assuage the pain of that? And I think that, that's the challenge. No more trips to the shop? Oh, well spotted, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> For those in need of refocusing, Father Christopher's words have the desired effect. The wonderful thing about Benedictine life is that it's not like training an army. What we're saying is we want people to enter into this life gradually till it becomes their own way of life, their own values and that it starts to change the way they approach other people, starts to change the way they approach themselves, life, and helps them to be more attentive to the needs of others and attentive to the voice of God. Nick has no problem being attentive, but Father Mark, his spiritual guide, is keen to try and pin him down on the question of faith. Within the way you see things right now, is God someone or something requiring translation? But the word, yes, because the word is in itself only a word and has no intrinsic meaning. So you have to say, well, what do we mean by this word, God? And, and what do you mean by God? That's a big one. <laughs> You've got five minutes. <laughs> uh, you see, I... On a good day... You see, if, if, you, if you say, do you believe in God? Hmm. Well, first of all, I'll say, well, what do you mean by you, God, and believe. <laughs> I can just about handle do? the two. And <laughs> That's a good refuge. Um. <laughs> and then I'll say, well, on a good day, yes. Mm. How you get from there to the God of faith mm. is difficult. I prefer being the kind of person I am to just keep it simple, stay at that very abstract level. At the heart of, of what I see um, mm. the Christian faith as being about mm. is a simple statement that isn't simple mm. about the Son of God incarnate. Mm. Um, now, I'm aware... Yeah, it's, it's a very not simple statement. It's a very not simple statement. Um, but, I, but I'd like to ask you to, to, to look at that statement. Mm in what's done here, what's said mm, here, mm, what's mm, mm. sung here, <laughs> mm -hmm. what we've been doing today. Yep. Um, because I think that's what we would say we're about. I have been thinking about, you know, this whole business of Jesus Christ, human God. Uh, how do you kind of get your head around that? Um, which, of course, is the heart of the Christian 
faith and, you know, um, just happens to be the bit that I have the most difficulty with. Um, what Mark is probably wanting me to do is actually stop sitting on the fence and uh, <laughs> come down one side or the other. And I, you know, I've, I've got used to sitting on the fence. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I'm squirming a bit already. <laughs> See, look at him, really keen, really keen. I'm not really keen, I just don't want to pull a muscle. This is a jog, Tony, not a sprint. <laughs> is that your life philosophy? <laughs> you know, pace yourself. You've got yeah. eternity to get there. <laughs> yeah. It's no coincidence that the longest chapter in Benedict's rule is about what humility. What are you bringing with you, for goodness sake? This is my little FM radio. You don't listen to me, this is a run, man. You're not, not here. Of course you, you listen to We're music, not... it gives you... We don't it need makes that. you thrust forward. You've got this beautiful crying. landscape. It's when I can't be bothered to talk to you lot okay. anymore. OK. Anyway, let's go. If the monastic community is to flourish, each monk must learn to be truly humble before God, ridding himself of ego, arrogance and pride. After just ten days together, the new arrivals are struggling to live up to Benedict's ideal. I just find that Anthony holds almost everything back. I haven't really got anything to say to him because I can't engage with him on any kind of emotional level. I mean, he's very... I mean, Anthony talks a lot about money and the fantastic bars in Mayfair that he drinks in and his car and his wealthy friends and polo matches he goes to. And, and money is clearly Anthony's god. I do wonder why he's here or what he's trying to find. What's your first sort of response to the word humility? Is it something that you have thought about? Perhaps it is, perhaps it isn't. I've been to rehab and done a year and was doing wonderful in my life and the pride rose up within me. I thought, I've made it. You know, my life is back together. And I walked out the door and within a period of time, I hit the deck, big time. But that, isn't that something also is disciplining yourself and a bit of strength to have a bit of belief. What I'm trying to say is you are fortunate that you have a strong whatever you've got to, to say no to yourself not to do that there. I don't know exactly how you feel inside when you mess up or have a mistake, but I know that how I feel when I feel... Yeah, but I'm also not somebody who's been completely teetotal all my life. Yeah. I got involved in many things, but there came a time in my head when I knew I didn't want to do it anymore. Well, you, you may have strength, but you will not, never have 100% strength. You, there will always be the potential for weakness. You have the power to say no. You have the power nobody, to... nobody stops you from saying no. No, that, of course. That is your will. Yeah, nobody just, stops just you say no, kids. That. Fine, but... Sorry. Anyway, yeah. no more. See, uh, yeah. sorry just to say... Sometimes you can become very black and white, you know, if it's not this, then it has to be that there. But... Well, I think see the world black and white. I see the world in a very panoramic way. Yeah, Some people but, see it very like this. Yeah. I see it like this. But I used to see but it like But I just don't to... think that I yeah. have to give you all of the information no, no, straight don't. away. I think I, I drip feed you, basically, so you can... You know, if I give you all of this information at once, then because you've got your own stuff to deal with, I'm giving, putting a whole load of weight on top of you, basically. So I prefer to give you it in small details. You might be quite closed about the actual specific reason why you're here up to this point, up to the ten days in. But you are very open about who you are, who you see, where you go, what you own. OK, yes, I bought my house a little, a little while ago. I deal with lawyers. OK, I make enough money to survive. But, yeah, they're just things that generally come out. I'm not telling something that's not true. But you're missing the point. I'm not begrudging well, you. I'm point? not be no, but it begrudging seems you like anything. That, but, not... but it seems like What that. I'm saying but is... It, but it seems like, and it's because of the way you're directing the question at me. What I'm directing... You know, there is a way of putting a question, and there is a way of putting a question, the way you're putting it. Well, I apologise like for my, you know... No, please for my, don't. My, my crude technique. Not if you don't mean it. But the question I'm asking you is, right, we're here for spiritual reasons, mm -hmm. right? So far, after 10 days of being here, I've, kept, I've got spirituality off every, everybody else apart from you. And I can probably feel like I can empathise and know you a lot better from the last 10 minutes.
than I can from the last 10 days. And I'm saying that's a good that's thing. Good. All I'm asking you is, you, why did you feel that you couldn't be a little bit more open and a little bit more honest from the word go? Because it takes me time to trust you enough to give you that information. And I just think that sometimes I'm aware of that I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings, or I, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm in the community, you know, wherein I need to be sensitive to how other people feel. I just sometimes think that you're not. You have to be sarcastic, you're cracking jokes, and think, do you know, is it necessary? OK, other people might not be offended by it, but I get offended by it, because I just think, you know what, if turn the clock around and let somebody do that to you, how would you feel, basically? Yeah, well... I don't want you to think I'm A, in confrontational, B, insensitive, because those are two things which, deep down, I really am not, and I know sometimes that that's the impression I can give. So, you know, I'd like to put that to one side. Well, then let's put it to the side and move forward. OK. Trying a water after that. Humility. <laughs> well, it's interesting it came up in that context somehow, mm, somehow, that was perhaps. And, and a sense you want to just sort of carry on talking, and in a sense I just want to sit quietly, you know, and, and just say that's, that was holy ground. That was holy ground. I know that I can walk into a room and try and take control and try and lead it from, from the first second. And I think there's a tendency that you can, you know that you're doing it, but you can also feel that maybe you're getting away with it. Um, whereas he's seen that as just a, um, an expression of ego, and he's seen that as a, a, as a negative thing and quite a self-absorbed thing in my character, which I secretly know to be kind of the truth, I suppose. So he did open up, you know, an old wound as far as kind of sussing me out a bit. Well, it's certainly a le lesson in humility, which is ironically what the whole hour was about you know and if I'm gonna I've, I'm gonna have to try not to be that domineering personality if I'm gonna learn any sense of humility at all despite having got his point across Anthony is upset by the realization of how others in the group see him today I was very sad, sad. yeah I still feel it actually I actually did, didn't really want any part of this anymore to be honest and truthful. I, I feel like at certain times in certain discussions, I felt, is this an interrogation or is it a conversation? Because the conversation turns into an interrogation, and that's not what I'm here for. Right. It's not about confrontation. Well, you're not here to confront other people, but you might be here to face up to something in yourself. Um, there's certain issues that uh, are not... Hmm. Not major issues, but they obviously need dealing with. And sometimes... They're issues for you. Well, yeah, they're, they're issues that linger, basically. And it's kind of... It kind of I think every so often it, it, it forms a gate for me. You know, I, I'm talking about my mother. I, I never had a great... You know, my mother wasn't there for me. She wasn't kind of... I didn't feel loved when I was a child. So I think many of most of my life, I was always trying to find someone to love me, basically. And then at a certain point in my life, I decided, you know what? I don't want to find anybody to love me anymore because the only person who's going to love me is me. Sorry, I talk about <laughs> No, no, this is good. Because you're being very honest about how you're finding the process, you know, is affecting you and it's obviously affecting you very deeply. And the process involving the other people is affecting you deeply. How does this relate to the process of the monastic life that's going on around this? Do you see a connection between these two at all? Um, I think the only connection would be that obviously there's five of us there and the idea is for us to communicate and to get on with each other. Right. Um, obviously, you know, I was very aware before I got in here there was going to be one person I didn't like and there was going to be one person I did like. But who's the person who's going to teach you most? Well, I think probably they're that person. Which one? I think probably the person that I don't like. Yeah, isn't that, <laughs> because isn't that then it's for me to deal with them. I mean, that may be a surprise to you, but it's absolutely central to what happens in monasteries. Have you always been Anthony, though? Uh, at school. 
few people to call me Jason. Right. When I left school, I used to hate the name so much that I decided to use my middle name. Right. Any individual setting out on a spiritual path needs to grow in self-knowledge. And the most real way we grow in self-knowledge is through seeing ourselves through the eyes of other people. Now this means that any individual who is serious about being spiritual has to live in some kind of community. St. Benedict's adamant about that. find any love in your heart for them. I just hope that we can sort it out. I really do hope we can sort it out for, for both our benefits and for the community's benefit.